Hello, welcome to the Appleton here in Ocala, Florida. My name is Miss Deborah, and I'm so pleased to be with you here today for the second day of painting possibilities. When we get started, we have two very different directions that we're going to go within our painting today. Doing things that are so unique and different is a good way for you to practice different skills and to start developing your own style and to discover more about what you like best and how you would like for your artwork to look. And you can see my example here. This is some very, as the artist likes to say, happy art. It's just happy. It feels good. It's what we might call contemporary or pop art. The gentleman, his last name is Brito, and he lives actually here in Florida in Miami. I have a picture of him that I can share with you right here. What Brito does is take very simple, basic, everyday kinds of shapes, things that uh, are appealing to people that tug at their heartstrings, perhaps, and divides them into simple areas and fills with bright color and patterns. It's easy to like, easy to enjoy, and it's easy to make our own interpretation of his work. So because we're here at the Appleton, we are going to do an apple in the Brito style. If you choose not to do an apple, of course, that's perfectly fine. I would encourage you to do a simple shape. You might want to do the first letter of your name. You can do a heart, a beach ball. I would just for... For our purposes today, have a central focal point, and then we're just going to radiate with different patterns. I started this piece because I wanted to show you, this is actually just done with color pencil. And I think you'd agree, it's quite successful just as it is. There's a lot of opportunity just working with color pencil, even crayons, especially for this style that you'll end up with beautiful pieces. The one thing that I would encourage you is to saturate or to make sure that your colors are nice and bold, works in bold colors. And in order for people to recognize that, yeah, we're inspired by him, that would be one of the calling cards that says this work looks like Brito. Yes, we are going to use paint. When I move to the canvas, we'll be painting our design. In the in the past, sometimes people don't have all the supplies. And just to show you that it can be done successfully, I went ahead and did this. But I'll walk through and just show you quickly what we're going to do. And then we're going to spend a moment talking about patterns. So as I mentioned, we're just going to start with a very basic shape, in this case, an apple. Brito actually does a lot with apples in both 2D and 3D. Um, the only kind of highlight that we have here to, to distinguish it from being flat is this little area here to show that there's light on the subject. Then basically, you take your shape and divide it into sections. This might look a little bit like the project with the resist tape where we taped out areas, big shapes. It, it kind of builds on that. I'm just doing mine on the white canvas. So in my background, I just kind of radiated out from the focal point and then broke down. These are all, oh, they're pretty much the same size. You can do that however you would, would like. From there, we're going to add some pattern. Now, I just briefly put in some patterns here to give you some ideas because the thing about Brito's work is the individual areas are the same pattern. I really do not recall seeing them getting mixed up in one area. The simplicity and what makes the design so strong is keeping that separation between your lines and your shapes. And speaking of patterns, I did go ahead and put together some simple patterns just to get us started. And one of the things to keep in mind with your patterns is for instance, for instance, on lines, of course, our lines here are just straight and evenly spaced. But there's a 
lot more that you can do with lines to add a different pattern, but using the same basic technique. Now I did include curved lines down here just to kind of get us thinking along that line. But also, of course, with lines, we have zigzag. You can make lines that radiate out, lines that are wavy or wavy. And if you just want to take some time to think about different patterns that you can make with lines, so what we'll do when we fill in, of course, is repeat this. So if I'm using this wave, and then I would color in. On dots, again, of course, all the same size dot, small dots. They can be dots within side a dot. The dots here, I wanted to point out just quickly a little trick to keep your dots evenly spaced, if that's what you would like. The way that I do that is I start with a dot in the center. And then if you're familiar with what a, a dice, what a die looks like. So if you had your dice here, this would be the number five on the dice. And I just space out my dots starting that way. Well, that one's not perfect, but that's okay. And then build out from there. Of course, the dots don't have to be evenly spaced by any means. It also adds visual disinterest if they're not evenly spaced. Some other shapes are what I'm going to just call organic shapes. So they can be something or they could just be a shape that perhaps is repeated. It could look more like a cloud. Of course, here I have hearts for an example. Uh, you'll see in Brito's work, a lot of simple kind of flower power type flowers and any other kind of fun design that you might want to repeat in a pattern. I'm gonna shift up here. I call these dashes. So basically just repeating a simple oval, you can make this into a design in itself, perhaps by repeating the position of the dashes. You can make thin dashes. That's probably what we normally think of as a dash. And curved line, of course, that would also lean a little bit more towards wavy, zigzag. The thing here is you can really see how it's radiating out. And and of course, that lends itself to a rainbow pattern. And last but not least, a geometric design. Again, that could be anything. So you could repeat squares. You could repeat squares inside of squares. Uh, triangles for the example. Dots can also be included into geometric if we think of those as circles. It just basically is creating some kind of interesting pattern that you want to carry out throughout your design. All right, so if you have some ideas, we can go ahead and get started. I'm gonna just set that up there. As I mentioned, we are gonna paint. So I have my white canvas here. One of the, I think, easy things to do that makes it very personalized would be a big, bold first letter of your name. So for instance, my name, Miss Deborah. I could start in the center. with a big bold, you want to make it bold because you want to be able to add some pattern in there. One of the distinguishing characteristics on the Brito pieces is they're outlined in black. Now we're not going to do that to the end, but you want it to be bold so that you can outline it in black. I'm using this black right now so you can easily see it. And then I would just encourage radiating spaces out from there. A heart, a heart works great for this project. All right, I have my white canvas here. I ran ahead and made a template of the apple that I'm going to be using. I wanted to fill the space I'm just going to go ahead and add the radiating lines to my canvas here. I want to make sure that the focal point, in this case the apple, takes up a sizable amount of space on my canvas. 
I have a nice big space here. There's plenty of room to add additional patterns. So yeah, and that's a, it's definitely an easy shape to use. It'll give you a successful project. It'll always remind you of the Appleton. And Brito did a whole series of apples, all kinds of different ones. And I'm doing it kind of dark ones so you can see it. And also when I, when we are done with the design, I'm going to outline it in black. It's part of the, what distinguishes his work. And it just really makes it pop on the paper. All of your colors pop. I missed a spot right there. You can see that just doesn't look quite the same as when I add in. Voila. Okay, a couple things too to keep in mind when you're choosing um, the colors that you want to use. They don't all have to be distinctly different. Of course, the pink and yellow here, um, these colors contrast and really pop on the paper. But also, I see a lot in his work where he uses the same color and different shades of that color. And that it's real successful. In, in highlighting your patterns. In the rainbow, I think that adds a lot. And I plan to duplicate that here to just to have that mirrored on this side. But it's not necessary to have all those different colors. And if you have too many of those, it's hard for your eye to know where to look because it's all so bright and colorful. Another thing to keep in mind is you're going to repeat. You can see here, I repeated the colors between the lines and the dots. It ties it together on the paper and your eye then can run around this way to see that there's something similar here. It's reaching for things that are similar as it goes around the paper. It's repeated here again with the blue background, but I also use blue in this cloudish shape up here. You're welcome to use whatever colors, of course, that you want. I have limited my colors to just the primary colors, knowing that I have white. I can always make pink or a lighter shade of orange. And I can make orange because I don't actually have orange. We are going to be painting. As a matter of fact, I'll get my paints out right now. And I'm going to start with just some, oh, I'm going to start with just some warm colors. So I'll start with yellow and red. I have my water already here to rinse out my brush. I might need a little bit of water, but we don't want to water these paints down much now. We want to keep them pretty saturated so the canvas doesn't show through. Saturated means it's like 100%. So it's not like a watercolor. Those colors are not saturated, but these colors right out of the tube, these acrylic paints are what I'm using, right out of the tube are saturated. So I'm gonna start with a small brush cause I'm gonna just go right into this area here. This is my highlight, but I'm not thinking of it just as a white area. I'm still gonna use pattern and color. I'm not very concerned about staying within the lines because I know I'm going to outline it in black when I'm done. I'm just going to go ahead and I'll use the same brush because after this red, I'm going to combine a little bit of the two and of course make some orange. 
So not only is orange one of my favorite colors, but because it's a warm color, it just adds an appeal to the painting that'll contrast nicely when I add some blues. So you have several different areas that you're going to be filling with pattern. So certainly you're going to repeat some patterns and that's good. That's perfectly not only acceptable, but desirable because your eye wants to, it will search out those similar patterns. It adds a, it adds a well, it does, there, there will be contrast because we're not going to repeat the same pattern all over and that'll produce contrast, but it also produces, you, you'll produce some similarities, some things that are similar. Okay. I think that's, it looks to me that the canvas is not showing through on my colors here, which I definitely, I don't want that to show through. I'm going to just go ahead and mix a little bit of yellow and a touch of red, just a tiniest bit of red. So I get some orange going here. As I mentioned, I'm only using primary colors. So basically, although there is green here, basically I only have red, yellow, and blue. So I need to make the other colors. Like I said, they have green in here. I'm not sure why that is, but that's okay because that'll save us from making it. I can make different shades of green with that through using my white. I'm going to avoid using black on this. We'll be using more black later, but on this painting, we'll avoid black except for the outline. So one of the things as we're working on this canvas and with this paint, before we do any outlines, we definitely want to make sure that the paint is dry. On this little area right here, I'm not, and that is really only because that yellow area that I started with was kind of small. So I started with the small brush, but as I'm going through this here, I'm going, whoa, I can't wait till I get to the bigger brush. Some of the areas when I start filling in the zigzags or uh, certain size dots, yeah, this, this little brush is going to come in handy. But when I start filling in the background color, I'm going to want to use a larger brush. Okay, so we got to start there on the highlight. And I'm going to go ahead and think about some of the patterns that I am going to incorporate here. I do really like the curved lines. So I'm definitely Definitely going to make sure that I have some of that. And I'm going to start right here. And you know, I'm going to bold these up a little bit so I can use my broader brush. I have a good size canvas here. I think this is like nine by 12. I have a good size space. I don't need a bunch of little things. I need some bold things. And as I mentioned, I'm going to repeat. I may or may not repeat the same colors, but I'm going to repeat that design over here as well. And I'm not too concerned. I guess it's a geometric shape that we didn't talk about. Is a star. Stars are awesome. So we'll include some stars here. You know, they can be tricky, no doubt. And for our purposes, they do not have to be a geometrically perfect star. We're just going to make a nice bold star. And this is a good place for me to mention these two stars are fully within the space. If I, I feel like I need a star over here, but this star is going to go behind the apple. So I need to just put it on the edge. And putting it on the edge suggests it gives the illusion that it's behind the apple. And I would encourage you to make sure that at least some places that the design runs right off the paper or under the apple. 
I will see, I have another one. I keep things very evenly spaced. I have to try very hard to make things not evenly spaced. So you'll see throughout my work that it typically is. It's not that I try to do it. Actually, sometimes I try really hard not, but it's just part of who I am. And that's how it shows up in my work. Okay, I've got some patterns going here. Let's see. Oh, I have a piece of kind of waxy paper here that I'm using. And the reason that I'm using this is one, I have got some uh, pretty good size. So as I'm working, I can move it and turn it around to use the other side. The, the paper plate is, is a much smaller than this. And when I'm done, I can fold it in half and set it aside easily. And it, it won't hopefully... <laughs> It, it won't spread or get in anybody's way. Okay, you can see we're getting some nice patterns going here on our canvas. So maybe I'm going to think about it a little bit more and I'm going to go ahead and, and add some more color. I think that what I'll do is I'm going to, I definitely am getting a little bolder brush, a little bigger brush. This is probably a half inch brush here. And in this area, I know I'm going to have, a, I've already decided Decided, I'm going to have a yellow background and I'm going to have red stars. So I'm thinking what I can do is just paint the background yellow rather than in this case, painting around each star. I think it'll be okay if I do that. Now, I don't have to paint the entire space. I can leave the areas where I know I'm going to want a star, but I'm pretty confident that that red paint will cover over the yellow. And the only challenge that I'm going to have is I need to let the paint dry. I think we mentioned before that when you're working on a canvas, it's a good idea to take that paint off to the side, off the edge of your canvas. That way, when you're ready to hang it, the whole piece looks finished. I'll just, I've got paint on my brush. I just went ahead and did that quick. It is a little easier when you're using paints right out of the tube to go back if you miss an area and, oh man, I got to paint that red or uh, let's say we'll use the yellow because I know I haven't added anything to it. So if I need to come back, I can do that easily. And while I'm using this yellow for the background, I'm thinking of, what else is going to be yellow that I know now that I'm going to add yellow? So I start carrying it through on some other areas. There. So I did leave plenty of white for my star, but I didn't worry too much. If it got in there a little bit, that's okay. So that way I was able to cover the whole area uh, pretty quickly. Okay. So this I know is going to be a rainbow. So I have red, orange, yellow. 
And remember where these two colors come together, the, or these two yellows come together, I'm going to have a big bold black line. So it's still going to end up being separated. What I'm doing right now is it ended up, there was a little kind of a glob paint along my line. And I want to remove that because otherwise that black line is going to look bumpy right there. So I'm going to pull it in away from that there. That's better. So that came off the side of my brush there when I was kind of pressing down and left that. Okay, I am going to repeat this rainbow because I like them so well. Red, orange, yellow. Okay, I've got some yellow here. I'm gonna go ahead. I know there's some places I'm gonna need some orange. So I'm gonna go ahead and just make a little bit more orange. I'm gonna use another brush to mix it up. And then I'm thinking I need to add some more patterns here. So as I'm going along that I can work out that design and the colors. Now there are a lot of different ways that you can approach. You can finish all all one area at one time. I could do the whole rainbow at one time. For some people that might make just perfectly good sense to do it that way. I have a tendency to, in, in my work, I like to work all over the canvas. I like for it to develop kind of all at the same time, not one area totally finished at a time. Oops, I don't want to use this little brush. I think that it's a little easier for me to see how the whole painting is developing as a whole when I'm working from side to side. Some people, um, I've heard some people, they'll say that they work in a clockwise motion. So they work around in a circle. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite that specific about it. I kind of do it where I think it needs it. Okay, again, and I don't know if you can see on, on my screen, it looks like this is all pretty close. I can see a little bit of white in between the two colors. I'm going to outline it in black. I'm not worried. Okay, what other kinds of patterns are y'all using? I think I need a zigzag in here. And I need, I can tell by looking at this, now I have all these warm colors. I need to start breaking it up with some greens and some blues. And then I will get around to making that, that purple. Um, other patterns. So I have these big dots here. I think I'm going to pull some, yep, more dots over here. These will just be a good size. Regular dots. Remember, I'm going to go off the edge here to kind of give the illusion that it's going over the apple. And here, on my highlight. We won't see all of that. And you can see here I have continued with dots. They're different, but they're the same. So I have that continuity, something that's similar in the work. I think that I'll just add here. And I really did like these cloud shapes. I'm trying to make them a little bolder, a little bigger. I know I'm going to use pink up here, pink and blue. So then in my mind already, I'm, I'm already thinking, okay, I'm going to get ready to do purple pretty soon. <laughs> Glow in the dark colors could be crazy. Okay, and let's see here. I think uh, zigzag to me is a pretty strong line. It's, um, it's a little edgy. I think we'll do a little bit of it right here. So you might notice if you watch my pencil, I'm actually thinking about how this line's going to be going as it goes back behind. So that didn't have a lot of zigzag to it, but I think it gets the message across. I definitely have hearts. Let's see here. Oh, dashes. How about some dashes? And then I have the space down here. Two spaces left. Any suggestions?
I feel like maybe just a little bit right there. Okay, one more area. And then I have all of my patterns established there. Um, we were talking waves, lightning bolts. Ooh, lightning bolts are pretty edgy. <laughs> How about I'm going to do, let's see here. I'm thinking this way to bring the eye back into the painting. If I had, Okay, I think I can put my pencil away from right now. And it looks to me as I was working on that, I need to get some yellow up here. I have these circles within circles. I think that what I'm gonna start doing here is start adding another element, another color. So let's go with some green and yellow and to start thinking yellow, blue, and of course that would make green. And I think I might as well get ready to get some white. I'll scoot this over just a little bit. You can see there, I've got some additional colors that I'm gonna be working with. Okay, so for starters, let's get some green in there. I'm gonna have two shades of green. So I'm just gonna lighten up the green that comes right out of the tube with this white. It's kind of a uh, teal. It's not actually what I would consider a light green, but you know, I think it still is okay. Yeah, I actually kind of like it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's when, when we were talking a, a little bit earlier about uh, making sure that your canvas does not show through. Part of what makes the painting look like a Brito is big, bold, bright colors. We don't want to weaken that by allowing the canvas to show through. And I also, like in this color here, I made sure that I made a little more than I think I'm going to need because I want to repeat that same color throughout the painting somewhere. So I think what I'm going to do is on these lines down here, I can go this kind of aqua and add a blue. All right, because I think that we definitely would like to talk about the other painting that we're going to do today. I'm going to take just a minute. I know that this area over here is dry, so I can add just to give you the idea. Now I'm using a marker to do this basically just because it's easier and it's quicker for me right now. If I wanted, I could also do it with a paintbrush or they even have things called paint pens that it just makes it a little easier than the paintbrush. But you see the difference now in how these areas pop when you add that black outline. I think that you have done an amazing job here in getting the essence of this Brito painting. The next painting that we're going to do is very different than this. This, we could call it a little bit more abstract, but definitely pop art. It's fun. It's happy. What I'm going to do is take just a minute and I'm going to go ahead and set this aside so that we can talk about another technique that we're going to be doing and another other artist that we're going to be inspired by. So let's set this aside here. Okay, so 
The next artist that we're going to be talking about is Claude Monet. You do know him. He's super duper famous. If you don't know that name, that's quite all right. You've seen works that are either his or inspired by him. He was part of the Impressionist movement. This is one of the books that we have here at the Appleton. And this one is particularly fun. Basically, there's a little girl that visits various paintings and artists. And this one is just wonderful because it's a book that opens up. Now, Monet had a beautiful garden and many, many of his paintings, uh, he did write in his own garden. So there's themes that you'll see throughout his works. And lily pads are a big part of that theme. And also what you might see in some of his work is this bridge. It's uh, pretty famous in that he would repeat the same image and sometimes would even sit in the same place and paint at various different times of the day because a very important part of the Impressionist movement and what these artists were looking to convey to the viewer was how does light affect these paintings? How does light affect the way that we're seeing things? Now, this is an example of, um, it's going to be our inspiration for our painting. We're not going to worry about this bridge. If you want to put a bridge in, you can always put a bridge in. What we're going to focus on primarily is light and brush strokes. Because unlike the Brito, where we were really just trying to achieve a nice, smooth coverage on the canvas, the Impressionists often had a thickness of paint. Now, they also had things that they added to the paint to achieve that, and we're not going to do that. But through the technique of how we use our brush, we can give that illusion. We can give that impression. So here, we're going to think about, this is actually a little pond, and it's kind of greenish in nature. It has probably a lot of um, growth in it with algae and also lilies, lily pads. Very important imagery there. Also, we can establish a foreground, what's in the front of the painting. Our midground would be right here in the middle. This is where the pond is. And our background. And in the background here, you can really see how there's a play between the dark and the shadows in this tree and where the light is hitting this side of the painting. So this has a very layered technique. You do don't achieve this by putting one stroke of the brush down. It takes layers to build it up. And the last layer that you're really thinking about is that heavy play of light. So here we have a vision of starting with a basic impression. Today, we're going to be doing this scene with a pond and basically just green, green trees, green shrubs, and a little bit of color to indicate where these lilies and the lily pads are. In this painting, I don't know how well you can really see with the flowers on this painting. Um, there are no petals that are obvious here. They're really just kind of blobs of color. So this is the kind of thing, even if you squint at it, those blobs of color are what come alive as flowers, not something that we can look and go, oh, that's a nice petal. Okay, so I have my black canvas here. And on the black canvas, what I'm going to do to start with is to sketch out what will ultimately be my foreground, what's in front, the midground, which essentially is going to be the pond, and my background. You don't have to have a black background. As I mentioned, really what we're going to be working with is the technique of using our brush to create an impression. So, like I mentioned, we are primarily interested in laying out the basic design that we're going to work with. 
the foreground, the midground, the background, and start adding some brush strokes to give us the illusion, the impression of the scene that we're working on. It's predominantly green, but we know when you look out at anything, a green forest, a green field, it's not just a flat color. There's a play of light and shadow. So we want to think about this as we're working to achieve that illusion of light. All right, I'll go ahead and start um, just thinking about the basic design here, although this isn't a perfect one third, one third, one third, but because we're going to establish a foreground, a mid ground and a background, you can kind of think of it in thirds. I have a white pencil here that I'm just going to give a little quick sketching out. I'm going to establish I have the start of my pond will be right here. I've added just some nice big shapes that are going to be shrubs and bushes. I know that there's going to be grasses here. Remember, we've talked about this before. Thinking about grasses, they grow from the bottom, the ground up. And when we use brush strokes, we're also going to be following that same development so it looks more realistic. This over here is going to be a willow tree. If you're familiar with willow trees, they have these arching branches that cascade, that droop down with long leaves or long limbs filled with leaves. So we're just going to make some of that look with our brush. Remember, it's an impression. We don't have to worry about it being exact. Okay, so that gives us just a basic basic kind of an idea a feel for it i have some paints here that are going to work because as i mentioned this is predominantly green blue yellow and just a tiny tiny bit of white but we'll get to that much later because that light is the very last thing so i need a fair amount of blue and actually gonna need a tiny bit of black because some of this blue needs to be dark. And I want a nice green green, a bright green. So I'm going to have a nice amount of yellow so I can make my own green. Remember that green that we had there? That was kind of a different shade of green. Okay, so the main thing when we start with our brush strokes, and we're going to go ahead and start in what's going to be the watery part is the water, those strokes are going to go horizontal. And we're going to use short brush strokes to kind of just get that in a little bit. We're, we're not worried about going directly up to the line and down to the line. We just want to get an impression of where that water is going to be with little short brush strokes so that we can see. We want to be able to see those brush strokes in this instance. Then we'll come back down to the foreground and finally start working up into the background a little bit. So I'm going to start with a little blue. This is the blue directly out of the, the tube. And because it's on a black background, it's pretty dark, but you can still see, well, that doesn't exactly look like a nice pond surrounded by green. But I'll put a little bit of that down because remember I had mentioned we're going to use use layers of paint. So I'm using horizontal brush strokes here. And you might be able 
Well, that doesn't look very true to me because the light is hitting it. But that's a good example is how light hits things, how it's going to change how it looks. So I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to fill this area in a little bit for starters. As I want this area, there's certain areas I need for it to dry before we go in front of it with the green. Otherwise, it's just going to smear it. So I don't want to get it too thick. I can, I'm going to go back and add layers to it anyway. Now, what I have done is I have a broader area here in the front is this is where the viewer is going to be focusing on. And then it, the pond itself, it just kind of gets narrow and disappears back there. Now, this pond has a lot of growth around it and in it and growth being green. So we're definitely going to be adding more green to it right now now I'm going to go ahead and take some of this yellow and blue. I need a little better shade of green, something a little more interesting, darker. With these colors too, frankly, you don't have to mix them real well. There's still colors. You can see perhaps the yellow isn't totally mixed in with the blue. That's okay. Because I'm going to be working with short strokes, I can mix that a little bit as need be and even use the variation in the color to our advantage here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just block in a little bit of area. So I'm just using kind of the wide part of my brush and I'm going to, I'm dabbing my brush just to fill in some space because later I'm going to come back into it and add more vertical. I have a little bit of area that's lighter here in the front as it comes forward. And I'm thinking about this area coming back, going away from me. So I'm okay if that's a little darker back there. That'll help give that illusion that it's going away from us. I used the side of my brush to give a little more space to cover a little bit more quickly. And then came back with the top of my brush to kind of break it up a little bit so it doesn't look white and black blend it a little bit so it doesn't look quite so um, like choppy. going to get a little bit more blue here. Keep working up that green color. The black canvas, it really helps that if we don't cover it totally, it's kind of okay with this type of painting. And like I said, we're going to come back into this and work, work up some strokes that'll give more of the illusion of grasses and individual plants. We're working on just covering this canvas a little bit here. Here in the front, down in the corner, I'm going to add a little bit more blue just to darken that up again because the light's going to be hitting here on the top. Okay, I think that's pretty good coverage here for me down here on the bottom. I'll get this little bit over here quick and then I'm going to move to the background of my painting.
This is a little hard to see. At least it, it is for me um, because the it's so dark on this black background. But what I want to get in here a little bit for you to, to see and to experience so that you are working with your brush in different um, different fashions and in, in different angles. So here we were working horizontally to start putting in the water and you can see it it's still pretty dark right now I got a ways to go to build this up in the foreground that light I was able to bring that up a lot more quickly because it in working with that bright yellow but these strokes are all um really for a technical term kind of smushy and I'm, I want to show something more than just smushy eventually there and in working here in the background we had talked about the willow so i want to start bringing in just a bunch of strokes that are a little more arch and lines coming back down towards the water again that they're they're flowing in the fashion that they grow i'm not worried about it actually showing oh that looks like a willow tree i'm just trying to establish the impression that we have these arching cascading limbs and leaves so we have more uh greens and I'm bringing in, in even a little bit of blue. Eventually, we'll bring in some um, yellows to highlight that. Good point. Um, I'm, I hope that you can see that because that's a, really an important part of the paintings themselves is just like you had, had said before, they were so smooth. That's what everybody was going for. That is what was acceptable. That was the sign of a good painter, the impression has changed all of that and forced people to think about it differently. Well, and that would have a big impact because then um, suddenly with photography, it would be so much more accessible to people that um, I'm sure it was quite expensive to have portraits done um, in the traditional sense, but certainly then would, would uh, still ultimately, especially then, I don't know that we have so many people pose for paintings now, except for maybe the president, of course, they do a, a painting every year there. So this is the painting that I have here in front of me that I'm looking at that I'm going to be working to build it up towards this, except I'm not going to put the bridge in there. So right now I'm still really just putting in some of the basic paint to fill up the canvas. And then we're going to come back. You can see here, particularly in the foreground, how the brush strokes are vertical because this is what I'm going to be bringing in next are some of these strokes to establish that these are actually green areas, green plants that are growing. And I think this is dry enough here to actually do that. That was part of what I was also waiting on. So I can come back to this area here later. But right now, we'll work on the foreground a little bit more so we can start bringing in some of those vertical lines. And then I'm going to also lighten up where the light is hitting this water. We need to lighten that up a little bit. And then I think I'll have um, just just enough time to possibly put in a couple of kind of rounded dabbing images to give that illusion of lily pads. So I need to make a, a much lighter color here to tie in. So I'm going to get some of my yellow and just to kind of change it up a little bit. Now I am actually still working with the same brush. Um, this is like a, a half inch flat brush, but now I'm going to be working on the 
side in order to get vertical strokes with it. This has a, quite a bit of yellow in it. So let's get a little more. I'm going to get some of this excess paint out of here. I want my brush to flatten out so I get that nice vertical stroke. Now you'll be able to see right away what a difference adding some of the vertical brush strokes. Now I'm really starting to see some grasses. Maybe they're cattails. I have the light hitting right over here in this area, so I'm going to add even a little bit more yellow and continue that here, a little more yellow on my brush. And something that I noticed I was doing is there are certain areas I work pretty quickly down here, but as I come up here and I really try to want to try to get a more defined line that goes from thick to thin, I slow down. I slow down because I really want to get that to come off the edge of my brush. I need a little lighter touch and I'm going to pull up on my brush at the end of the stroke. I'm going to bring a little bit more light over here. It's kind of fun for me as I am looking at the laptop screen and I'm seeing the painting from there. It's kind of like if you take a photograph of your painting, sometimes you'll see things in the photograph that you don't see when you're actually working on the canvas. A lot of times if there's something that, oh man, I don't know, I just don't quite like that. If you take a photo, I take a picture and then look at it, you might see an answer. You might see, well, this area over here just needs a little more something. So I've moved into the water there just a little bit. And in doing so, I brought in a little bit more yellow to give a little more light just to put in. So I've got that started. And remember, because I'm, I know I'm on the water, that I have changed my brush stroke here. Now my brush stroke is going horizontal. That's one way that I'm showing that it's different than what's directly in front of it here behind it. And I could probably spend another, oh gosh, I, I bet I could spend several more hours building this painting up as I study it more, um, areas that I want to increase the light in, but I don't want to do that all at one time. I want to build it up so we know I've got some light coming over from this area. You can see it here in these bushes or grasses rather primarily, and here it's it's it, what's going to happen is I'm going to have this nice shadow where the water's actually meeting the side of the land and the grasses here, which is, is perfect. That happens naturally because of the way we put the water in first and then built up the front. And now we're going back and building up the front again. So it's going in front of the, the water there. So be sure you're signing and dating your work. Okay, a few more grasses in the front, and then I am going to just add a little bit of color for um, to suggest the lilies and the lily pads. I think I shall get a new brush. This area right here. Yeah, that definitely needed that there.
but this is going to be a shrubby bushy area so i'm gonna just get in some more color lighter at the top where the sun will be hitting it where the light's going to come into it And again, I'm just smushing it here. So yeah, I didn't develop this very much. And then this is more like just a total gardeny, foresty area. So this back area here will just be kind of a suggestion with darker colors. Um, I need some more green, green, no green, green. So I want to make sure that this area doesn't isn't as light as this area here. This is is where my light is coming from so it can hit right off the top of the trees here but then as they come around it's actually going to get darker again and when I'm I'm looking at it I, I don't want it to appear that there's a conflict whoops that was yellow I want to make sure that that stays in the background that visually it stays in the background and one of the ways that I do that is by adding a darker a darker color again. Now, in order to kind of smush that out, such a good technical term, I'm using the top of my brush and dabbing at it. This will be another area that honestly, this whole background area, I haven't really developed yet. I need to work on the colors here and I'll add some more light and dark areas because it's not a mountain. It's going to be bushes. And by adding uh, some shading and some different variations of tones in there, I'll create that. So one of the things that, that we had talked about is adding just a little bit of a suggestion of lilies and lily pads um, in our painting here. Now she has a lot. In our inspiration, she has them here in the foreground and here. And basically the way that this has been achieved is little blobs of various shades from from red to kind of mauvey pink color. And then at the very end, dab of white, just to lighten it and to give a really overall impression that the light has hit the tip of it. So just to give you an, an idea of how those might be, I'll get another brush here. I'm gonna have a smaller round brush. Where's that little, there. This little round brush I think will be good. So I have just a little round brush. And this painting, as I mentioned, this isn't anywhere near done. I haven't worked at all in this background area and my water needs a lot of work. Over here, it just looks like, well, a place where an alligator would live back there. But we did get in some nice foreground and some definition here so that you can see the land isn't just like totally flat there. It's probably pretty marshy over here if you stepped in it over here here, you might even sink into it. So let's get some, uh, we'll make a little nice brighter green here. Just going to round up some little parts so that I get the illusion of a floating lily pad. And it's right in my light. So those are pretty light. And then, as I mentioned, the flowers, these flowers are a, a kind of a pink. So I have a little bit of white, a tiny bit of red. Again, I don't care necessarily that it's all mixed up together. If I have some whiter and lighter and redder areas, that's okay. And I'm just going to make some dabs to dab out some flowers that are floating there. As I continue, I wouldn't just leave such a few. I would bring them down and maybe even some in this marshy area here. I could add a little bit more red to some just to give them a little bit more variation of color, make them look a little bit more of the impression that we're going for. And then the last thing, really probably when you're just right before you put your signature on, the tiniest bit of white. 
be, we have so much green and red and those colors are complementary that it really makes a difference adding just a little bit of that pinky reddish color. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you add some more flowers to your painting as you are developing the rest of the areas and then come back and add that. That when you when I look at mine now, I go, yeah, okay, it's not just a bunch of green and a little bit of blue. Thanks so much for coming. Bye everybody.